welcome. This is our next to last lesson in this series as we look today at Pentecostalism and the Charismatic Movement. And uh, this is a 20th century movement. I, I wrote Pentecostalism and the Charismatic Movement first, and then I realized, oh, I didn't put the 20th century in front of it. So then I went and added it. That's why it looks so terrible up there on the board. But then it's so high up that I didn't want to erase it and redo it. That's why Michael Spain teaches in there, by the way. He couldn't reach this board, so, uh, so I, I can barely reach it. So uh, that's why I chose to teach in here. Um, so today and then next week we'll be looking at all the way up to the present day as we look at uh, liberalism, uh, fundamentalism, and uh, neo-orthodoxy, not fundamentalism, evangelicalism, which is an outgrowth of fundamentalism. So liberalism, neo-orthodoxy, evangelicalism, and look at kind of where we are today and uh, where we go from here, uh, hopefully. So uh, we're going to look today, though, at the, the 20th century movement known as Pentecostalism and the Charismatic Movement and see what, what uh, this uh, period of the church's history has to teach us today. So uh, I'd like to begin by reading from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 9. And Paul writes to the Corinthian church in his greeting, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him, in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, we thank You again for this Lord's Day and the joy it is to gather together as Your people. And we truly pray that Christ would be exalted among us today and that we would worship You in the power of the Spirit. Guide us through your word and through the teachers of the past, uh, both where they align with your word and where they don't. Give us discernment and wisdom as we study today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've looked at a number of doctrines that have taken shape over the history of the church. Um, I could go through and, and list each one. Uh, we talked about the doctrine of creation in the second century, the doctrine of God in the fourth, the person of Christ in the fifth, sin and grace in the fifth century. Uh, into the Middle Ages, we looked a little bit at, at several things, but one of the things was how the doctrine of the atonement came into greater focus. And then into the Reformation period, the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of salvation. And then with the Baptist theology we looked at last time, we saw how the doctrine of the church, I, I believe, came into greater biblical alignment with the rise of the Baptist movement. In the 20th century, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit has received quite a bit of attention because of what we're talking about today, Pentecostalism and the Charismatic Movement. There are an estimated 280 million Pentecostals worldwide, which is a big number. And uh, if you add on top of that independent groups or other denominations that are not technically considered Pentecostal but have Pentecostal leanings in their theology and practice, there are many millions more. So this is a, a major force in world Christianity. Um, in Africa especially, the global church is moving uh, largely among Pentecostal groups or Pentecostal-like groups. South America, uh, a lot of the same is happening. And so this is something we need to take seriously, reckon with. And I think at the end of the day, we need to thank God for uh, the spread of the gospel that's going on among these groups, even in, in areas where we might disagree with their theology and practice to some degree. Uh, let's face it, it's probably better to belong to a Pentecostal church in Africa than to be a pagan. So um, the gospel is spreading, and uh, this is something for which we should give thanks, and we should also exercise discerning wisdom as we seek to evaluate. When I was a uh, youth, I was invited to the local Assembly of God church for some kind of event they were having uh, with, by one of my friends, and I went, and uh, everything... As I was experiencing the worship service, everything seemed pretty normal. Uh, the people were a little bit more emotional, a little bit more prone to, to raise their hands and so forth uh, during the service. 
Then toward the end of the service, things started to get weird. And that was when uh, people started speaking in tongues and uh, they would have, uh, you know, people were all praying at the same time. So it sounded like this chaotic mess. And then the, the one who preached the service that evening was going around and tapping people on the forehead and they were falling back. And uh, at that point, I, didn't, I, didn't, I was a young man, I'd never been exposed to that before. I, I didn't really know what to do with that. So uh, it was difficult to process and it, it sent me into a, uh, a time of great confusion and uh, trying to figure things out about where I stand on these kinds of issues. And, and I think at first, uh, just as a defense mechanism, I immediately began to assume, all right, well, this is either from God or the devil, and I know it's not from God. So, uh, and I think that's, that's probably a knee-jerk reaction that many of us might have if we have not grown up in that kind of a tradition. Uh, we might Im immediately assume, well, this must be satanic. Uh, and that, that may be a defense mechanism for us to say, you know, my experience hasn't been the same, and since my experience isn't the same as that, um, then uh, I must really be missing out if that's real. And yeah. so uh, we, we might tend to be too quick to be skeptical. Well, I was very skeptical of what was going on at first, but I think over time, I would argue that I've become a sympathetic critic of this movement, a sympathetic critic, sympathetic in many respects, but also critical in many respects as well that I hope to lay out for you today. And there are basically three issues that come before us when we address Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. And uh, those three issues are theologically the doctrine of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, The second issue is what we'll call evidential tongues. I'll explain what that is. And then the third issue is, more broadly speaking, spiritual gifts. So we will uh, look at these three issues in particular today uh, as we talk about this movement. And all three of these pertain to, of course, the Holy Spirit. Um, so... Uh, before we, we talk about Pentecostalism proper, it'd be uh, nice to recognize uh, some antecedents to Pentecostalism in church history, that there were actually some movements that began to anticipate some of the emphases that came out in Pentecostalism. And I would call these two-stage versions of Christianity, meaning one stage is you become a Christian, and then at some time later there's a second stage, a major um, elevation to a new level. And so uh, probably the first example of this, uh, I may be wrong, but I think the first example of a two-stage Christianity actually comes out of Puritanism. Uh, and the, the Puritans, not all of them, but some of the Puritans argued that conversion is the first stage, conversion to Christ, but at a second stage you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that's uh, Ephesians 1.13, Paul makes reference to that. So they would argue sealing with the Holy Spirit is actually distinct from conversion, and it's uh, an experience that brings the assurance of salvation. So uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, you've probably heard that name, uh, the famous preacher who stands somewhat in the Puritan tradition, he argued very strongly for this understanding of sealing with the Holy Spirit. Um, John Piper actually holds this view as well although he hasn't made as much of a big deal out of it in his ministry, but he does, in fact, last I heard, hold to this view of sealing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but this was a two-stage Christianity that arose in Puritanism. In uh, Wesleyanism, which was like Puritanism, it's a renewal movement that comes up a bit later. Wesleyanism, named for John Wesley, uh, who led many of the first Great Awakening movements in England and here in America, 1730s. Um, Wesley argued for a new understanding of what's called sanctification or our, our becoming holy before God. He argued that you, uh, you are converted at one point, but then later you will have a, you can have, you don't necessarily have, but, but some believers will have a second experience of grace, a second blessing that will immediately raise them up to an experience of what he called entire sanctification, which means uh, you completely uh, move away from all known sin. No more known sin in your life as a believer from that point on. So uh, this was the Wesleyan doctrine, 
And uh, I can recall, again, a story from my youth. When I was in uh, uh, middle school, I think, or maybe early high school, I think it was middle school, um, I had some friends who were actually part of the, uh, the Nazarene church in my town. And the Nazarenes, as I'll mention in a moment, the Nazarenes are actually in the Wesleyan tradition. Yeah. And uh, several of my friends, they had a youth minister who left, and so they were, their church was going to call a new youth minister. So they called a young man to come and uh, to interview for that position, and he spent quite a bit of time, as I recall, maybe several weeks um, filling that position, getting to know the kids, spending a lot of time with them. And the kids loved him. He loved them. He loved the church. It seemed like everything was a great fit. And then at the end of the process, the committee at the church said no, and they, they sent him back. And uh, one of the women who was on the committee, very kind, loving woman who cared about the young people, she, she was explaining to them, and I happened to be with a group of them uh, when she was explaining to them. I don't remember why I was there, but I was there for some reason. And uh, she was explaining to them, this is why we decided not to call him. Um, we were, as we interviewed with him, we came to the question, are you sanctified? And he answered, no. And so we decided we couldn't call a man who wasn't sanctified to this office. Now, at the, as, at the time, I didn't have the theological categories in mind. It really wasn't until I got to seminary, and I took my first seminary class, that I began to look back. It's like, that's what they meant by, are you sanctified? Have you experienced this uh, entire sanctification that John Wesley spoke about? Um, and Dr. Ware at, at seminary, whose first uh, class I took, taught about this. He called it an elevator theology, that you, you're one day you're at, at this level, that all of a sudden you rise up just immediately, just by an act of faith, you rise up to the next level. Uh, it's not a matter of works, but it's just entirely by faith that you are entirely sanctified, just as you are converted. So uh, the Puritanism begins this two-stage Christianity. Wesleyanism makes it a, a pretty major feature of their theology. Uh, but Wesleyanism, as a, on the whole, didn't necessarily hold to it, didn't uh, at least long-term hold to it. So in the 19th century, there was another movement known as the Holiness Movement that was a, a renewal movement within Wesleyanism. And the Nazarene denomination is one of the no denominations that came out of this. Uh, so the Holiness Movement was a a movement among Wesleyans to uh, really emphasize entire sanctification as a major part of the theology and to recover that. And so you've got a number of what are called holiness denominations today that um, grew out of that period, the 19th century. Well, it was uh, some of those groups that ended up becoming Pentecostal or that, that be became uh, more or less what we know, know as Pentecostalism today. There was a man who led a ministry, a man named Charles Fox Parham, P-A-R-H-A-M, Charles Fox Parham, who uh, was the founder of a Bible college in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, the story I'm about to tell you is um, a story that I learned from Dr. Chad Brand at seminary. And Dr. Brand, as he told the story, um, was careful to say there's probably some embellishment that goes into this, so this is not necessarily all true to history, but this is the story that's been passed down. So the story that's been passed down is this. Charles Parham, who had founded a Bible college in Topeka, Kansas, um, was asking his students to think deeply about this issue of the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as it's taught in the New Testament. And he was set to uh, go on a winter break, and he was going to leave campus for a while in the uh, break of 1900 to 1901, which is, of course, the beginning of a new century uh, about to start. And so he asked his students who were going to remain on campus during that time to study this issue. And uh, according to the story, they, as the students were there over the break, they were studying on December 31st of 1900, right at the dawn of a new century, uh, some of these students began to speak in tongues. And uh, this became to them an experience that showed them the significance of baptism in the Holy Spirit so that when uh, Parham returned, they were able to report to him, our understanding of baptism in the Holy Spirit is that it is marked by the evidence of speaking in tongues, that if you are baptized in the Spirit, you will demonstrate that by this manifestation of what we'll call here evidential tongues. So if you speak in tongues... You're baptized in the Spirit. Basically, if you don't speak in tongues, if you've never spoken in tongues, then you're not baptized in the Spirit. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. Now, keep in mind, 
Speaking in tongues was not a practice that was widely known at this point in history. This is a new thing. Uh, so for them to claim this is actually quite radical uh, because speaking in tongues had basically fallen off the radar of most Christians throughout the history of the church uh, to this point. Not to say no one did it, but it just was not widespread practice. And so they begin to argue this, this is actually, evidential tongues is actually a central aspect of Christian experience because it, it actually marks you out as those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit. So uh, Parham eventually had to close that Bible college in Topeka and he started a, a more itinerant mish, uh, movement known as the um, uh, Apostolic Faith Movement and he ended up strongly influencing a young man, an African-American man named William Seymour in Houston, Texas. And according to the story Dr. Brand told, uh, at this time, William Seymour was not allowed to sit in the classroom because he was black. But uh, he was able to listen outside the door as Parham was speaking and teaching on these things. And so Seymour was heavily influenced by this early Pentecostal theology, you might call it. In 1906, Seymour uh, ended up moving to Los Angeles to become a, an associate minister at a young missionary church that was starting there. And Seymour began to teach this doctrine of baptism in the Holy Spirit marked by the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. And as he began to teach this, more and more people began to experience it. And uh, eventually the church grew and grew, the ministry grew and grew to the point that it had to move to a new location and it moved to a place called Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Have you ever heard of the Azusa Street Revival? This was it. So uh, William Seymour was the, uh, the major catalyst for the Azusa Street Revival that broke out in Los Angeles, leading then to the development of Pentecostalism uh, in terms of a, a formal movement and ultimately a number of new denominations arise that we now call Pentecostal denominations. So that's uh, an overview of how Pentecostalism got started and some of the distinctive features of them, especially baptism in the Holy Spirit as a second work of grace that uh, the initial evidence is speaking in tongues. Now you can see how that somewhat mirrors the Wesleyan uh, idea that, that entire sanctification is a second work of grace. But since they're not talking about sanctification here, but more of empowering for service. That's, that's how they envision the baptism of the Holy Spirit empowers you to serve God more effectively. The uh, Pentecostal doctrine of sanctification basically reverted back to uh, what you might call a, basically a reformed understanding, that it's just a continuous process throughout life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit may be a factor, but it's not the, the main focus in sanctification. So that's Pentecostalism. The charismatic movement is a bit distinct from this. The charismatic movement is uh, a movement that arose within other denominations. So Pentecostalism actually became its own distinct denominations. Charismatic movement, on the other hand, arose within existing denominations, and only in a few cases did it result in the founding of, of a new network of churches, you might say. But for the most part, it operates within established denominations. In 1960, a man by the name of Dennis Bennett, who was an Episcopalian pastor in Los Angeles. See, Los Angeles where all this stuff ends up happening, right? Um, he began having some conversations with some, uh, some couples in his church who were having these home Bible studies. And, and these couples began to tell him that they had experienced baptism in the Holy Spirit uh, with the evidence of tongues. So basically mirroring the Pentecostal teaching and uh, Bennett began to meet with them, and he experienced the same thing. And so he uh, began then to teach that at his church. He, he basically decided at some point to come out as a more or less Pentecostal, but still an Episcopalian, who's got this uh, Pentecostal theology. So um, his bishop, you know, in the Episcopalian structure, you've got a bishop over you if you're a pastor. The bishop promptly dismissed him from his position and ended up moving to Seattle to a, a church in an area that was more receptive to his message. And from there, uh, the similar kinds of things started happening in other denominations. Uh, in Baptist life, I think the main figure who brought the charismatic experience and theology into Baptist circles is Pat Robertson, uh, whom you probably know from the 700 Club. Have you ever watched the 700 Club? you ever noticed how, 
how different Pat Robertson is from most Baptists in the way that he talks and prays and so forth? Well, he's, he's basically a charismatic Baptist uh, who brought that into Baptist circles. Um, there are others who arose in, in all kinds of denominations. There's even charismatics among Catholics uh, who uh, do similar kinds of things and experiences. So basically the charismatic movement arose within existing denominations. And into the 1970s uh, began to actually modify their theology. They, they no longer strictly held to the idea that you had to speak in tongues as the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began to move away from that. They, they thought it's perfectly fine if you speak in tongues, but, but it's not a, a prescription. It's not a necessary evidence for baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then by the time you get to what's called the third wave of, of the charismatic movement, so the first wave would be Pentecostalism. The second wave is the beginning of the charismatic movement. The third wave has been identified with churches known as the Vineyard Movement, which was the 1980s. Uh, if you've ever heard the name John Wimber, uh, he was one of the, the founders of this movement. Wayne Grudem was actually associated. I know you've heard the name Wayne Grudem, I'm sure. Uh, he was associated with the Vineyard Movement for a time as well, and much of his theology is, is related to this uh, Vineyard Movement. Well, in the 1980s, in the Vineyard Movement especially, um, charismatic theology even moved away from saying that uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is a second work of grace. They would argue, no, baptism in the Holy Spirit is, is something that just happens when you're converted. Uh, so basically their theology is much the same as what I'll be arguing for today. Uh, basically a historic Baptist position on these questions, but they're still distinct in their great emphasis that they put on the spiritual gifts, especially signs and wonders, miracles, prophecy, uh, speaking in tongues. They still practice it even if they don't regard it as uh, necessary for baptism in the Spirit. Uh, healing. All of these things that they, uh, they seek to emphasize. And if you know Wayne Grudem, if you know his theology, he's argued very strongly for a, uh, an emphasis on these aspects of the life in the Spirit, though within scriptural parameters so that we don't let them get out of control. So among all of the, the theologians who have more, more or less of a charismatic background, I think Wayne Grudem and others today, as, as the movement has grown, it's matured a lot, and it's, uh, it's got a lot more scriptural structure to it. And that's one of the good things that you notice in church history, is that any movement that starts, that has as one of its fundamental convictions uh, that the scripture alone is our authority, our supreme authority, that movement is going to tend over time to get better. It's going to mature over time. Uh, movements that don't hold to that are going to get worse, but movements that do hold to that tend to get better. So if you go back in history, you look at, for example, dispensationalism. I think dispensationalism started with a lot of loony business in the beginning. But as it's matured over the, over the, the ages, that it's not ages, but over the century, century, couple of centuries, uh, decades, uh, into modern times, it's, it's gotten a lot more uh, mature. It's gotten a lot more biblical in its convictions. I think the same has happened with covenant theology. Uh, I think the same kind of thing has happened even with Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. So um, that's one of the good things to take note of here is that uh, as it would be, you would imagine it would be the case, when in, whenever anything s starts new, uh, it hasn't had a lot of time to think about the ramifications of what it's saying, right? So when you start off with something new, you have to work through all the stupid things you said at first and realize, hey, that was stupid, and then come around to uh, correcting that over time. So uh, that's just an overview of the story. Let's now evaluate some of the issues, these three main issues that we brought up and draw some conclusions for us today. The first issue, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Is this something that is separate from conversion? Is this to be expected as a second work of grace? Now, let me, um, first of all, tell you where I stand on this. I believe in line with um, pretty much every Baptist I've ever heard of that uh, conversion uh, is tied up with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, in other words, is one aspect of what it means to become a Christian. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I would argue you're not a Christian. And if you are a Christian, you are therefore, by definition, baptized in the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that I'm denying uh, the genuineness of whatever second blessing many have claimed to have. I'm not denying that that's a genuine spiritual experience. For some, I think it is. For others, it's probably not. But 
Um, I, don't, I don't have to say that that's all hogwash to hold my position. What I can say is that I believe either in a second work of grace, I, I, would interpret it just, I would interpret it differently from the way that those who interpret it as a second work of grace do. I would say that, that either they're getting saved for the first time, maybe they weren't saved before. And I think especially in some of these uh, mainline denominations where uh, charismatic theology has taken over, what's really happening is people who never heard the gospel before are finally getting saved. And, uh, and in that, they're having a dramatic experience. So it could be that they're getting saved for the first time, or it could be that they were saved previously, but they are now for the first time uh, beginning to uh, take that seriously. And so uh, there can be what you might call second works of grace. There, there can be things that, that are um, dramatic moments in the life of a Christian. I'm sure that many of us in this room could report to having uh, dramatic works of Christ in our lives after we were saved. Uh, but what I would object to would be to say that that is the paradigm for every Christian, that every Christian must go through these two stages in order to say that he or she has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The argument for this is based on four chapters in Acts, or really three chapters. Uh, the fourth one uh, I'll get to later, but three chapters in Acts that come up in baptism in the Holy Spirit Acts 2, um, 8, and 19. What you have in each case is, in Acts 2, for example, the disciples, the, the 120 disciples of Jesus who are in the upper room, they, they seem to have already been converted by their contact with Jesus before, but then the Holy Spirit comes upon them powerfully on the day of Pentecost and they begin to speak in tongues. So if you take that as a paradigm... You have them coming to believe in Jesus at one point, and then sometime later, the Holy Spirit baptizes them, or they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, I guess is a better way to put it. Uh, so you seem to have two stages in Acts 2. In Acts 8, you have um, Philip, who's not one of the twelve. This is Philip, the, uh, the deacon from Acts chapter 6. He goes to Samaria and preaches the gospel there, and the Samaritans believe but they do not receive the Holy Spirit until Peter and John come from Jerusalem and lay hands on them. And then the Holy Spirit comes on them. And it doesn't actually say that they speak in tongues there, but it seems to be implied that they do because Simon Magus clearly sees and hears something happening and wants to pay the disciples, the apostles, for this divine power that, so that he can do it for others as well. So clearly something happened that caused Simon Magus to respond that way. And the, the pattern of Acts is that they spoke in tongues. So uh, in Acts 8, then, you've got, you've got conversion and then later baptism in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, you have Paul in Ephesus, and it says that he met some disciples while he was there. And uh, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their response was, we did not even know there was a Holy Spirit. And then he said, uh, that's, that's the Baptist answer, right? We don't, we don't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Um, and so uh, Paul says, then into whose baptism were you baptized? They say into John's baptism. So then Paul preaches the gospel to them and baptizes them in the name of Jesus. They receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, giving evidence of that. So these three examples are argued by Pentecostals to show a pattern of conversion followed by baptism in the Holy Spirit. But I think in all three cases we have reason to say this is not paradigmatic for all believers. This is not Luke telling us this is the way it's always going to be. I think these are three exceptional circumstances. Uh, number one, on, we can go ahead and, and rule out chapter 19 to begin with because what you have in chapter 19 is not a second work of grace. You have a conversion there. Uh, that's, that's pretty clear, I think, if you just read the story fairly. These men did not understand the fullness of the gospel. And Paul explained it to them for the first time. They were disciples of John the Baptist, but Paul baptized them into the truth of the gospel and they became believers for the first time. So that one doesn't even teach a second work. Acts 2, of course, does show a two-stage, you might say, two-stage process for the disciples, but we're at the shift of redemptive history at this point. We're at a, at a point in history where the Holy Spirit hasn't even been given yet. The, the Holy Spirit's not definitively given until the day of Pentecost. And so we would expect the, the disciples who originally walked with Jesus and knew Him to go through an unusual process in their coming to faith as 
redemptive history is shifting from one covenantal era to the next. So they just happened to be living at a time when uh, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. They, they moved in the time when He was given. None of us can repeat that experience. And then in Acts 8, I think you have a similar thing that the disciples in Acts 2 are going through. What, what you have in Acts 8 is basically the Samaritan Pentecost. That is the definitive gift of the Holy Spirit outside of those who are Jewish. Samaritans are the first ones to receive the Spirit who are not entirely Jewish. Remember, they're half Jewish. So uh, this is the first time in history that the gospel has been proclaimed outside of Jewish circles and those who believe are not entirely Jewish. And so it appears that in the context of the narrative, God withheld the gift of the Holy Spirit until the apostles could get there so that they could verify, yes, indeed, this is a work of God. And in His wisdom, God did that so that the church that was beginning at that point had begun in Jerusalem and was now spreading into Samaria. That church would remain one church. Think about if the apostles had not been there, what could have happened? The Samaritans, on the one hand, could have assumed, well, we have nothing to do with the church in Jerusalem. And the church in Jerusalem, on the other hand, could have assumed, I don't know what's happening among the Samaritans, but it's not of the same spirit that we are. So you could have had arising out of that a Jewish church totally separate from a Samaritan church. But God in His wisdom ensured that the Jewish leadership among the apostles was there to pray for and therefore endorse what was happening among the Samaritans so that both they as apostles would understand the Samaritan believers are the same as us in Christ and the Samaritans could understand uh, we are part of one church with these Jewish apostles. So again, that's a, that's a unique experience in history. That's not something that is going to re be repeated in our experience. In addition to that, you have a number of stories in Acts of people getting saved without any indication that they had to experience a second work of grace. In fact, Peter on the day of Pentecost, Peter uh, actually, after he has just received the Spirit and the crowd that he preaches to says, what must we do? His answer is this, verse 38, Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So telling the crowd on the day of Pentecost, you will receive the Spirit, I believe in the book of Acts, is equivalent to saying, you will be baptized in the Spirit, just as we have been. So uh, one of the other key passages in this debate is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. And Paul, as he's writing about spiritual gifts, this is what he says. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. So, in one Spirit... We were all baptized. And then he goes on to say, into one body, which would indicate we are baptized in the Spirit at the same point at which we enter into the, the church, the body. So to be a part of the body is to be baptized in the Spirit. Notice how this parallels what John the Baptist said. You remember John the Baptist in the Gospel said, I baptize you in water. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So you've got um, parallel statements here. I baptize you in water. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. What you have in both statements is the baptizer which is I or He, that is John or Christ. You have the, I guess you call it the baptizee, you and you, the one being baptized. And then you have the element in water or in the Holy Spirit. 
So the baptizer, baptizee, and element. So in, in any baptism, you've got to have those three things. One doing the baptizing, one being baptized, and the element in which they are baptized. Baptized means immerse, by the way. Um, here uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul frames the, the statement differently. He doesn't, use, he doesn't say specifically who's doing the baptizing because he's using a passive verb. He says, we were all baptized. That's passive but you still have we as the baptizee, and then you have in one spirit as the element. So if the spirit is the element paralleling in the Holy Spirit or in water from what John said, and we are the baptizee, we're going to assume that he's talking about Christ as the one who is the baptizer. So in one spirit, Paul could have easily have said, Christ baptized all of us into one body. Now the reason that's important, I wanted you to see that parallel, because Pentecostals are well aware of this verse. And they will argue that it should be translated, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Uh, meaning that they're, they're making the spirit, the Holy Spirit, into not the element into which we're baptized, but the baptizer. And then they're going to argue from that that and this is kind of weird, but baptism by the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is different from baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is the second work of grace. So they, they end up then with two different baptisms of the Holy Spirit. One of them is baptism by the Spirit, where the Spirit baptizes us. The other is baptism in the Spirit. Now, I think that's a hopeless mass of confusion. Um, I think the simplest answer in most cases is the best one. And, and given the parallels here, uh, and the, even if you look at it in the Greek, the grammatical similarities between these two statements, you're talking about the same thing. If we begin multiplying more and more baptisms, we're adding unnecessarily to what the Scripture teaches. So um, I think Paul is speaking here of the same reality that John the Baptist spoke of when he predicted that Christ would baptize His people in the Holy Spirit. And he means an experience of immersion into the Spirit so that we are transformed from the inside out. Uh, in other words, it's, it's basically one way of picturing our conversion. It's a way of picturing this is what brings us from death to life. This is what makes us uh, go from being God's enemies to His friends. It's the fact that the Holy Spirit, um, Christ I should say rather, Christ baptizes us in the Holy Spirit making us into new creatures. And the fact that Paul links it with the, the time when we become members of the body shows clearly that it occurs at the time of our conversion. I would argue this is important because the two-stage teaching, I think, can be dangerous. Not always, it's not always dangerous, but it can become very dangerous. If you end up with two categories of Christians, those who are spirit-baptized up here and those who are not down here, or those who are entirely sanctified up here and those who are not down here. When you end up with that situation, it's very easy to promote pride in those who are up here and despair in those who are down here. Pride among those who think they've arrived, despair among those who so mad badly want to be up here but just can't figure out how to do it. So uh, you end up dividing the body of Christ into two categories of people that, that the New Testament simply doesn't bear out. And that's my biggest objection, I think, to Pentecostal theology. And uh, one of the reasons I'm grateful that uh, charismatic theology, at least, modified this view. And even some Pentecostals have moved away from it as well. Uh, so so that's, that's good news. Uh, the movements tend to mature, as I said, as they get older. So the second issue then, is, as well, I have to move quickly here, evidential tongues. This is basically going to be based on the same chapters plus one more. Um, in Acts 2, you've got them speaking in tongues when they receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, as I mentioned, no mention of tongues, but it seems to be implied. Then you've also got Acts 10, where Peter goes to Cornelius, preaches the gospel to him. The Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius and his household, the first Gentile believer, and uh, they speak in tongues. And then in Acts 19, the, the disciples of John the Baptist, when they are converted, they too speak in tongues. Um, Again, I think in every case, there is a reason to say this is not necessarily paradigmatic for all believers. In Acts 2, as I mentioned earlier, we're at a new point in redemptive history. The gift of tongues seems to be an indication of a definitive um, 
I don't want to call it a reversal, but maybe a redemption of what happened at the Tower of Babel. It's not a reversal of Babel because if it were a reversal, all the languages would become one again. But instead, it's more of a redemption of what occurred. So the disciples are praising God in all of these different languages that can be understood there in Jerusalem as an indication that God is now sending the gospel to the nations and He's bringing people of every nation uh, and every tongue to Himself. Um, I think a similar case is, is true in, in Acts 8 where you've got another breakthrough moment for the gospel. Uh, among the Samaritan in Acts 10, a breakthrough moment for the gospel again among the Gentiles. Acts 19 is a breakthrough moment in the sense that these Old Testament believers who followed John the Baptist are becoming New Testament believers. So it's significant, I think, that in all four of these cases, you've got what's called a major breakthrough moment for the gospel. And that seems to be what the significance of tongues is showing, that as the gospel breaks through more and more barriers... Uh, God is giving this sign to show His intention to send the gospel to all nations of the world. You notice you don't have any other mention of speaking in tongues in the book of Acts, and yet there are others who are converted throughout the book of Acts, many more in fact. Uh, the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, there's no mention of them speaking in tongues. There's no mention of the Ethiopian eunuch speaking in tongues, uh, and I could name many, many more, but uh, the indication is this is not Luke saying this is the way it has to be, but rather, this is the way God planned it for these major breakthrough moments. Um, then you have uh, the issue of spiritual gifts, third. Here, even though charismatics have moved away uh, from this theology among Pentecostals, and even to some degree this one as well, um, spiritual gifts is an issue where Pentecostals and charismatics all seem to agree. Basically, they, they agree on the fact that God continues to give all the spiritual gifts today that He gave in the New Testament, perhaps with the exception of apostleship. But other than apostleship, uh, and even some would say He still gives that one, uh, but uh, with the exception of that one, God continues to give all the same spiritual gifts today. This would be in contrast to a view known as cessationism, which uh, we studied in Sunday school last year, I believe it was, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. Cessationism would argue that the gifts of prophecy, tongues, and to some degree miracles, healings, these things were for one particular time in history to authenticate the ministry of the apostles. And uh, now that, um, that the apostles are no longer here, the, those gifts have passed away. They, they have ceased, in other words. That's why it's called cessationism. And uh, Pentecostals and Charismatics would argue, no, that's not the case. These gifts continue. We should expect them and we should employ them for the building up of the church. Now, unfortunately, these gifts are often used among Pentecostals and Charismatic groups in ways that go contrary to Scripture. Uh, so I'd mentioned at the beginning my experience at a church in my hometown where speaking in tongues corporately caused a great deal of chaos, I would argue, in the worship service. It seems that Paul addressed that pretty much head on in 1 Corinthians 14. I mean, it's not like an issue where we're left guessing what, what the Scripture teaches. Uh, the Scripture teaches there's not, this is not to be happening in our corporate worship services. There's not to be this kind of disorder that uh, if there is speaking in tongues at all in a corporate gathering, then it must be limited, it must be controlled, and it must be interpreted so that everyone is edified. Uh, it must not be done the way... That it was, and of course, a lot of the things that, that have happened out of this movement, as we could all probably name examples, are utterly ridiculous in terms of their disorder and their, their, um, their just disregard of Paul's teaching, especially in 1 Corinthians 14. However, with that said, did you notice the, the verses I read at the beginning from 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9? Lee made this point when he preached through 1 Corinthians. So uh, since I've never had an original thought in my life, I'm just going to repeat what Lee said at that point. And that is, um, notice that in the face of the fact that the Corinthians, as we know from chapters 12 to 14, the Corinthians are abusing spiritual gifts. They're using them the wrong way. Their, their worship services are chaotic at points. Paul does not say what I was tempted to say as a young man encountering that for the first time. Well, this must be of the devil. Paul doesn't say that. Paul actually gives thanks in his opening greeting to the church at Corinth. 
I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him, in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul recognizes the abuses. He's clear on that. Read chapters 12 to 14. But he doesn't for that reason then back off and say, hey, let's not, let's not even worry about spiritual gifts. Let's, let's forbid them. No, he affirms these spiritual gifts that they really are of the Lord, even if they have to be better controlled. And I think that's, that's much of how I would argue that I've become a sympathetic critic of the Pentecostal charismatic movement that I'm sympathetic with the concern to see that the power of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated in our lives and is demonstrated through spiritual gifts. I don't have time to go into a full biblical case for why I'm not a cessationist. Lee went through that last year, and uh, again, I've never had an original thought, so you can go back and look at what Lee argued there. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a cessationist. I'm not convinced that these gifts have passed away um, as long as we understand them rightly. And I think Wayne Grudem and others have done a great job of showing that the gift of prophecy can exist in a congregation and still maintain that it's not at the level of Scripture. Scripture alone is infallible and authoritative, but gifts can, can operate. God can still move in certain ways. He can guide us uh, in specific situations, and we have to judge, we have to weigh, we have to discern um, corporately. But, uh, but none of this threatens the authority of Scripture. Scripture still remains our supreme authority through it all. So I'd commend to you also the works of Wayne Grudem on this as well, uh, as if you're wanting to study more on it. So um, what do we have to learn here? Where do we go uh, on these issues? Well, I would argue that uh, if we are a church that is going to seek to practice spiritual gifts effectively, we must be driven by 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, where Paul says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. We should not pursue spiritual gifts for their own sake. Hear me when I say that. We don't pursue spiritual gifts because we think, wow, that'd really be cool if we were a church that practiced spiritual gifts. I don't want us to get into that mentality. I want us to think rather, how can I love my brothers and sisters. What does my brother or my sister need from me at this moment? What can I say or do that would build up and, and give comfort to and encouragement to my brother or sister? So if you are sitting in a Sunday evening service and you hear someone speaking of what's going on in their life and, and you just feel the Lord put something on your heart at that moment, that you think, wow, this might be an edifying word. I don't know if this is, I don't know if I'm, I'm hearing the Lord rightly. This is one of the things about Grudem's view of prophecy that I agree with. We don't necessarily always hear the Lord rightly. We may say something that comes out the way we say it is not entirely right, but that's why God put in place a process for us to weigh these things and discern them. So, so you're not going to come out and say, thus says the Lord. You're going to say, I think the Lord has put it on my heart to say this, and then just say it. Or maybe, maybe you can send that in an email to someone as the Lord lays it on your heart. Maybe you can say it in your small group. Maybe you can just say it in a conversation. But, but be open to these kinds of things. Be open to the fact that God uh, blesses us through one another, through these what we might call spontaneous words that He gives us. They're not infallible, but uh, they are a rich blessing if we pursue love and, uh, and therefore seek to edify one another. And I think the other area where this most should come out in our lives in addition to speaking to one another is also in the expectation and prayer for healing. Uh, I believe that uh, we ought to pray more fervently when people are sick. And, uh, and let that be our first instinct. Instead of just saying, uh, I'll pray for you, actually stop at that moment and say, let me pray for you right now. Let me lay my hands on you and pray for you and, uh, and ask God to heal you, even if it's not a big deal, even if it's just somebody with a sore throat comes in one day, you know, I've got a sore throat, I'm going to be down for a few days. Uh, well, let me pray for you. Maybe God will take that away. Maybe He actually will. And I think we should expect those kinds of things to happen more often. I'm not at all arguing for a name it and claim it kind of theology. This is one of the errors that, that, that Pentecostalism and charismatic theology can get into, where you just name it and it's yours because you have enough faith. Obviously, God is still sovereign 
We acknowledge that. He won't always heal. Uh, but I do think He commands us to pray for healing. And He tells us it's not presumptuous to do so. It's not any more presumptuous to pray for healing than it is to go to a doctor and to expect Him to help you heal. Uh, but we should actually do both. And we should do both regularly and more fervently. So uh, I would argue that's probably the two ways most uh, that this, these ideas of spiritual gifts can apply to us. And I do believe we just have a lot to learn from our charismatic and Pentecostal brothers and sisters about, about having our hearts really engaged with the Lord as we worship, as we sing together, as we hear His Word. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of reservation, I think, on our side when it comes to these issues. And, and there's just a lot we could learn about uh, being more free, less inhibited, not chaotic, but just more free and less inhibited as we encounter the Lord in our worship. And I'm still learning a lot about this myself, and I'm, I'm praying that God would, would work through the whole body to bring us to more maturity in, in this area as well. So um, that's all I have for today, and we've only got a couple of minutes. So if, if anyone has a question, I guess maybe I can take one or two. Yes. Right. Like different languages. Like they were speaking Aramaic or whatever, and then but they were understood in different languages. But then um, later on, it seems, or people nowadays who speak in tongues, it seems like you speak in a certain language. So, is there two types of things going on there, or understand? Yeah. So I think uh, let me rephrase the question. Um, in Acts two, you have the the disciples speaking in tongues, and they're immediately understood because there's a gathering in Jerusalem of people from from various parts of the world, and they're being able to understand them just by unmediated, uninterpreted speaking. But that's as far as I know, that's the only scriptural example where that happens. Uh, so some have argued, well, that's an indication that tongues are for the purpose of evangelism. I don't agree with that, though, because in Acts 2, the disciples actually don't bring anyone to faith through the tongue speaking. They speak in tongues, and, and the actual words that are used is, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God. So that could just as easily be interpreted to be a word of praise to God, declaring His mighty works more like a psalm might do. And that's what gets their attention so that Peter then stands up and is able to preach, and he's the one who evangelizes them, presumably in Greek, because most everyone would have known Greek back then. You don't have that happening ever again. And I, I wonder why that's the case. Um, I don't know entirely the answer, but it, but it seems to me, as I've studied the issue more and more, and especially when you look at tongues in 1 Corinthians, tongues are always spoken to God. Like God is always the one who's addressed directly by tongues. And so, so Paul will say, for example, one who speaks in a tongue speaks to God. Um, so the blessing that can occur for others when someone speaks in tongues is only a blessing that can occur if that person is able to overhear what that person is saying to God. It's kind of like if someone prays publicly and we're all able to overhear and say amen, then we can all participate in the blessing of that prayer. The problem with, of course, tongues is nobody can understand them generally, and that's why they have to be interpreted. Uh, so in, in the case of Acts 2, they didn't have to be interpreted because of the native speakers who were there. But in other, uh, in other occasions, it appears that they do. Did I get to the full question you had there? I don't remember exactly what the heart of the question was. Oh, yes, yes. Some have taken it that way, but that's not how I take it. I take it to be that some of the disciples were speaking. See, some, some would argue this is a miracle of the ear. So the disciples are speaking, and the same exact words that are heard as one language to one person are heard as another language to another person. I would argue that what's rather happening is you've got a distribution of actual languages that are being spoken among different disciples. And they're praising God in these different languages, and so some people are able to pick out hey, I hear my language there, and others, I hear my language over here, and others not able to figure out what's going on. They're saying, oh, they're just drunk. So 
And then Peter gets up and he corrects them by saying, of course they're not drunk, it's only nine in the morning. We don't get drunk until later in the day. <laughs> so he doesn't actually say that. I added that last part. So. All right. Yeah, good question. Uh, all right, well, we're about out of time. Uh, so next week we'll look at the story, how it concludes now coming into the present day with liberalism, neo-orthodoxy, and evangelicalism. You're dismissed.